Hello again, and welcome to our session about supporting wellbeing. I'm Wojciech Nadachowski, Chief Operating Officer of Autism CRC, and I will be your host for this session. The awareness of mental health as an issue in the workplace has risen significantly over the last decade. And we are reminded on a daily basis how central it has become during the COVID pandemic. With the increasing demands on staff being on and being available, whilst in an unpredictable and uncertain environment, being resilient and maintaining well-being comes with challenges. And all of this, as work is crucial and important to us, our identities are wrapped up in what we do. With what we do, we want to do well. We spend significant time at work, develop significant relationships and forge career paths. We are lucky to have three panelists today to help us unpack how to support wellbeing in the workplace for neurodiverse and autistic employees. Dr. Sarah Barker from Black Dog Institute, who also directs Enrich Health and Psychology, is a bilingual senior clinical psychologist, training facilitator, and psychology board of Australia approved supervisor. She has over 15 years experience in the public health NGO and private sector in enriching well-being in people and organisations with diverse needs, applying evidence-based psychological science. Sarah welcomes diversity, brings respect, care and empathy to her relationships and strives to build trust and honesty. Sarah seeks to understand people's and organisations' experiences, to gain insight into behaviour, teaming with them to create changes they seek. Sarah partners with people and organisations to support meaningful goal setting, harness strengths, create healthy thinking habits, develop creative practical solutions, and increase resilience, calm, and well-being. Her therapy, consultancy, and training offer people and organisations an opportunity to refocus, rediscover what matters to them, and develop and maintain respectful relationships. Well-being in the workplace is a strong interest of Sarah's, and she likes working to strengthen and enhance staff wellbeing and mental health. She has lectured at Australian and international universities and enjoys making the latest evidence-based findings about mental health issues accessible and relatable to raise awareness and enhance positive outcomes for the people they affect. Uh, also joined by Dr. Simon Brewery, who received his uh, PhD in clinical psychology from Flinders University in 2017 and his Bachelor of Psychological Science from the University of Adelaide in 2013. Simon's PhD was on the development of a new theoretical approach to hope. His current research interests include autism employment and mental health, social challenges and assessment, and the interaction of social and clinical psychology, for example, autism identity. Simon is a registered psychologist with experience working with children and adults with autism, trauma and conducting psychoeducation assessments. In the last month, Simon has also launched uh, a new mental health and wellbeing resource and training package, which he is presenting in the research showcase. Also with us is Dr. Lisa Smith, who is a late diagnosed autistic adult, advocate, carer and registered psychologist. Lisa completed her PhD in clinical psychology at Flinders University in late 2017 and has worked as a psychologist in disability, both subsequent to and after her clinical training. Lisa is also board secretary of ASAN AU Australia New Zealand and has recently commenced work as a casual researcher at Flinders University in autism research. Today's session will commence with a presentation from Dr. Sarah Parker and then afterwards joined by Simon and Lisa. Before I hand over to Sarah, I would like to let you know that you have the opportunity to submit questions at any time during the session by typing your questions into the Q&A pane. You can access that pane by clicking on the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. Please use this for genuine questions and not for chat. Other people's questions will appear in the Q&A pane once they have been approved by our moderators. If you like a question and are keen to hear it answered, you can give it an upvote by clicking on the arrow beside it. We will try to answer as many questions as possible, 
but depending on how many come through, we may not be able to get through them all. Okay, that's enough from me. Uh, let me introduce to you Dr. Sarah Barker. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'll just be one moment. I'll pop my slides up now. Okay. All right. A warm welcome to you all. I'm from Black Dog Institute and um, I thank Autism CRC for having me at the virtual summit today. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking about supporting wellbeing. So to begin with, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of this nation and the traditional custodians of the lands where we live, learn and work. I'm on Wurundjeri land and I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people. We recognise all Australian communities who, through their lived experience, which is really important, help to guide the research and resources developed at Black Dog. Okay, so a little bit about Black Dog. We are, for those of you who don't know about us, we're a global leader in mental health research. We are a research institute and we're the only medical research institute in Australia to investigate mental health across the lifespan. Probably of most relevance today is that we have a workplace mental health research program which is headed by Professor Sam Harvey and a lot of our focus and our, one of our big strengths is our mental health research in the workplace. So we'll have a look little, so everything today will be based on evidence-based uh, research and the strategies are evidence-based that we'll be talking about. So looking at supporting wellbeing in workplaces, it's a really important area. And um, yes, we're, particularly when we're thinking about uh, supporting the wellbeing of autistic and neurodiverse employees as well. So um, what we will be, yeah, and I, I guess that can, what we'll be looking at a few different areas. We're looking at recognising when people need help um, and this, this is in general, we need to be doing this in workplaces. One of the tricky things is um, people on the autism spectrum can um, be very, very good at masking. So we might not always recognise this really easily. Um, we know that people on the autism spectrum and neurodiversity is not a mental health issue, but there can be some co-occurring mental health issues that occur. The most common ones among all Australian adults are anxiety and depression. One in four of us at some point in our um, lives as adults will experience an anxiety disorder and one in 10 of us are likely to experience depression at some point in our lives. And this is across all industries, across all um, industries, different industries in Australia. So it's helpful for us to be able to recognise when people need help. That's um, recognising it in ourselves and recognising it in our colleagues too. So we're going to look at disclosure too today um, and what are, some, what are some benefits of disclosure um, of mental health issues and I suppose of neurodiversity too. Um, yeah, if that's something that people... Um, yeah, it could be helpful for a workplace to know because we know that, um, yeah, people with neurodiversity have great things to offer in workplaces. And I, I would argue we really need neurodiversity in teams. It's a real um, benefit. Um, unfortunately, not all workplaces are set up in an ideal way. Um, the social system there might not support neurodiversity. So um, hopefully we get more and more towards workplaces that do, but um, disclosure can be helpful to people so they can get um, the kinds of environmental um, adjustments they might need for sensory, um, yeah, sensory aspects and things like that. We'll be looking at too at an evidence-based model for having a workplace conversation about mental health. And finally, we'll be looking at creating a mentally healthy workplace. We'll look at, be looking at an evidence-based model called the five ways to wellbeing, which has been shown to really um, help promote and protect mental health in workplaces. So when we have a look at what um, well-being is, we probably need to start there. So the World Health Organization says well-being is a state of well-being where a person realizes their own abilities, where they can cope with the normal stresses of life, they can work productively, and they can contribute to community. So we'll keep that in mind as we go. 
So what, one of the best ways to recognise when perhaps someone's well-being is going down in a workplace is to be able to notice changes in behaviour. And I think to be able to notice changes in behaviour in ourselves, in our colleagues, for managers to be able to notice it in their teams, it's really, really important. So some of the things that we might notice, and generally when wellbeing is getting lower and perhaps mental health issues are um, perhaps about to um, yeah, occur, some of these behaviours can occur often more than one. So it might be that a person has more absences from work, they're taking more time off, um, it might be that people are more irritable when normally they're fairly even keeled, um, or it might be that they're less patient. Social withdrawal can be common too. Um, and yeah, it might be that people perhaps usually like doing the trivia quiz um, in the tea room of a Friday afternoon with everyone. And so all of a sudden they just lose interest and, don't, and start not coming perhaps. Um, it might be people don't, um, aren't eating as well or eating as much. That might be a change in behaviour too or eating more. Um, that can be because of stress too. We might also notice reduced activity, um, lower energy, um, productivity can change, output can change. That can be a change in behaviour when perhaps people's energy is usually better or they're able to be more productive. Um, we know particularly with things like anxiety that concentration can be affected, the cognitive load of anxiety, um, the narrative of what ifing that can continue on for a long time um, can really have a big impact. It can make it harder to absorb information, harder to remember information as well. So people might usually be very sharp, but suddenly they might be asking the same question several times because they're becoming more forgetful. Um, we also know that another change in behaviour might be a staff member um, worrying a lot about something when normally it might be something that would bother them so much. And patterns of worrying can slip into patterns of avoidance and procrastination too. So the person might feel in that moment that it's too difficult to face the thing that needs facing, whether that's a deadline or starting a task or um, a conversation that might need to occur. Another common change in behaviour can be that people um, may perceive uh, feedback that could be intended as neutral um, as, or constructive as criticism and might become more sensitive to that. Exhaustion and burnout can be really common changes in behaviour too, particularly if people aren't sleeping well and perhaps if they're experiencing um, depression or anxiety, um, they might not be getting a lot of sleep. So um, they can be coming to work very, very tired, um, perhaps yawning more. And burnout as well. I think if, um, yeah, if employees are carrying a lot of stress, they can be quite um, burnt out as well. Reduced personal care can occur as well. And I think sometimes if people um, are not, if they don't have the energy, um, they can, yeah, they might not have the energy and time in the morning to put as much effort into their personal care. That's probably not something I have a conversation about. In fact, I wouldn't, but it would be something I'd note as part of a cluster of behaviours. And we might find too that um, staff members might be more critical of others, critical of themselves or critical of things in the workplace and perhaps get stuck or focused on those and find it um, difficult to shift from that. I think during COVID, we've got to think too about if someone's working from home, um, the kinds of changes in behaviour we might see there. So we might see people perhaps not participating in online meetings or not turning up or having their cameras off, um, perhaps not responding to calls or emails. Um, and I think it's much more important that managers check in more regularly, not about work so much during um, periods where we're working from home, but um, just to stay connected and see how people are, I think that can make a really big difference to well-being. Um, yeah, so I guess in all of this, for all of us, it's really helpful for each of us to be aware of our personal stress signature. And what I mean by that, each of us, and it's going to be different for each person, will have small signs when we start to become slightly stressed. So I know for me, I hold my breath when I'm stressed, okay? That's part of my personal stress signature. When I'm a little bit stressed and I'm waiting for someone to, to respond to a question, I tend to hold my breath. And for me, that's a sign, Sarah, you just need to breathe. 
and try and relax because that's a sign you're starting to get stressed. Um, and then there are other signs that might be indicate I'm a bit more stressed, which are part of my personal stress signature. So perhaps my heart might start to beat or my mouth might start to get dry. Um, so these are things for me to be aware of. I think when we've got relationships at work with trusted others, perhaps with a manager or perhaps with a colleague, if we can share um, what our personal stress signature is, then others can kind of check in with us too and say, hmm, Sarah, are you holding your breath there as I'm giving my response there? And I might, I might realise the penny might drop and I think, oh, I am. And that's something to be aware of so that I can then do something to look after myself and catch that. So good for managers to be aware of personal stress signatures too. Okay, so our key messages. If we notice any changes in behaviour or in performance in ourselves, in our colleagues or team members, given the high prevalence of mental health conditions um, and given that we know they can co-occur with neurodiversity, with, um, with um, autism, then this is important that we're aware and consider that could there be a mental health issue if we're noticing a lot of changes in behaviour. But to find out and to help us notice changes, we want to be having regular chats with our colleagues and if you're a manager with your um, team members. We want to, in these chats, um, really be, and this might be in one-on-ones, but it might be more informally as well. We want to know how things are going. And I think it's really good practice as part of one-on-ones to have a heart-to-heart -heart and to have a, a part of that conversation where work's not talked about and where we just get a sense of how was your weekend? What did you get up to? How are things at home? Uh, as much as is appropriate, because different people have different levels that they're comfortable to share. But that really gives us a sense. If we know that someone goes bike riding every weekend and they love that, they do a long bike ride and suddenly they stop that, that's probably something to check in and ask about because these changes in behaviour give us a sense of the person. They give us a sense of how well they're going and, and how, they're, how they're doing. We also want to get a sense of what's happening in people's lives um, because that also gives us information too about how some changes in behaviour at work might give us some context. So if we know someone's got a very sick cat, um, you know, and they're coming to work very tired, and it might be because they're needing to get up every hour to tend to their cat, um, that gives us some context. We might know, okay, I know that's happening, so I'm noticing these changes in behaviour and there's a reason for that. But if the cat got well and the person continued um, to have several changes in behaviour that made you feel concerned for how their wellbeing was going, then it would be really good to have a check in about that and have a conversation about that and find out a little bit more about how things are going. And generally, we want to be aware of how our teams are working. Um, and a good question in one on ones can be how do you think the team's going at the moment? Um, and if everyone says, oh, I'm a bit concerned about Sarah, she hasn't seen herself that's a really good opportunity for a manager to check in with Sarah and see how things are and get a little bit more information. So these changes in behaviour are really, I think, a, a nice anchor around which to have a conversation and we'll have a look at how we do that um, shortly. Okay, so we've talked about noticing changes in behaviour and the reason these are so important and the regular check-ins with um, staff are so important is so that if something is occurring, there is a trusted relationship, hopefully, where people feel comfortable to disclose. And when we talk about disclosure of either neurodiversity within the workplace or of a mental health condition, um, yeah, we've got to remember very importantly that this is absolutely an individual choice. Um, it's a personal choice and we need to respect that choice. So there is no obligation at all to disclose. However, there can be many, many benefits of disclosure. And part of that is judging whether the manager or management or employer is going to be a workplace that responds with support. Important for us all to know though, that all employers in Australia, whether they are a small, um, very small business to a big, big, um, large corporation, all employers in Australia have a legal obligation to respond with support and reasonable adjustments if someone discloses neurodiversity or if they disclose a mental health condition. 
And this is really, really important that everyone is aware of this. Um, so this is under the anti-discrimination legislation, equal opportunity legislation, and workplace health and safety legislation. And from 2012 in the workplace health and safety legislation, this um, is the case even if the um, trigger for the mental health condition has not been at work. Even if it's something from outside of work, the employer has a duty of care to respond with support. Um, and this is because, um, yeah, th um, these conditions are, are considered a disability under legislation. So what are some of the benefits of disclosure? It's a big, it can take a lot of courage to disclose. It's a big consideration, but some of the real benefits of doing so is that can increase understanding. So um, yeah, if I perhaps, um, yeah, I'm feeling very anxious because I'm experiencing anxiety disorder and my um, employer is aware of that, they'll be able to look at that within context and respond with support and strategies and adjustments um, to my tasks or my environment. So they might be able to reduce um, some of the sensory, um, they might, might be able to make some sensory adjustments, um, whether that's tactile adjustments or um, yeah, other, other sensory aspects to an environment. It might be some other kinds of reasonable adjustments. It might be flexible start times. If a person's experiencing depression, later start times can make a really big difference because often um, people with depression find the afternoons a little bit easier. The mornings can be really difficult to get out of bed and really difficult to get moving, for example. So that kind of flexibility can make a big difference. Um, the other thing I think that can be really helpful is if it's if the manager responds well to um, the disclosure, it can really fracture and reduce stigma. And because others see as well, wow, that was responded to with support and care and respect. And um, yeah, stigma can just really melt, um, which is fantastic. Another important thing is if a manager doesn't know, then they might think, that, that, that if the manager doesn't know that the changes in behaviour are due to neurodiversity or a mental health condition, they might assume that it's a performance issue and they might start to use performance management, which we don't want. Okay, so if a person discloses, a manager then is able to um, use a health management response to support the employee in the to um, do their best at work and have the conditions that are going to be helpful to them to be able to do their job as well as they can. Also important that we remember, sometimes relationships with a manager are perhaps not ones that are most, we might like the manager, but we might not want to share that with them. We might not want to share um, that we're on the autism spectrum or that um, we're experiencing a mental health condition. If that's the case, it's okay to share that with anyone in the management team. So it can be a manager above your manager that you share with. Um, as long as someone in management is aware, then the employer has that duty of care to respond with support. Okay, so let's have a look at the next part. So our key message is creating a supportive and accepting work environment is really critical to assisting people to feel comfortable and safe to disclose mental health concerns or neurodiversity. And there may be a whole lot of benefits to disclosure, but we do need to remember this is an individual choice. Okay. So what I'd like us to have a look at now is an evidence-based model for an effective conversation about some mental health. So if we're concerned about someone, but that person hasn't approached us, how might we approach someone in the workplace? So um, yeah, this is an evidence-based model from Black Dog Institute. So first of all, really important that we choose a private place in which to have this conversation. Um, yeah, we don't want others, others around. Ideally, probably you wanna set aside at least an hour to have this conversation. The, com the first conversation might, might only take five minutes. The person might not respond very much, but it might be also be the first time the person chooses to open up and, and share. So important that we have that time and we can calmly delay any activities we might have, um, you, you know, that if it does need to go longer. 
Um, also important to think about the timing of conversation. So I often think kind of mid-morning can be a good time because both people are likely to be a bit more fresh then. Um, the end of the day is not such a helpful time because often people are stressed, they're tired, and maybe they've got things they need to get to after work. So around mid-morning can be a good time. Also, if a person's not safe or there needs to be any follow-up, um, there's time to contact services and get other supports in place. The next step that we need to do is when we start this conversation, I think is start with a positive behaviour that we appreciate about the person. So we might say, you know, you're usually so um, punctual and good at um, getting things done on time and the way you prepare reports is really thorough and you really think through everything really clearly. Um, lately, I've noticed that, um, yeah, things have been coming in a little bit later and that's, that's not an issue in itself. I'm concerned about how you are because it's not like you, okay? And then we're wanting to ask some open questions about this. And open questions are really helpful because they allow us to get a richer response from the person. So open questions start with things like what and how. Some really good questions can be using the acronym TED, which is T, tell me. Tell me how you've been lately. E, explain. Explain to me how that's been for you. Okay, this is after you've mentioned the behaviour. D, describe to me how that's been affecting you. If you think about it, they're very similar questions, but sometimes one of them will resonate a bit more with the person. Secondly, I think those questions show a really um, continued interest and curiosity in the person, and they keep us asking open questions because it can be very easy to fall into yes or no questions and close questions. Um, the other thing, as we're listening to that, we can use OW, O, observe the response, W, wait, leave some time and space for the person to talk and L, listen. So we want to yeah, keep our questions open, keep them respectful and try and read the person's responses too. The next thing we do, we've got to use our active listening and really we're not wanting to jump in with solutions there. We're trying to understand, get the person to talk, um, not giving advice at that point, just listening and really reflecting back some of the things we've heard to check either one if we've understood well. So we might say, okay, so you're telling me that you're getting up every hour to your sick cat at the moment and that you're exhausted and you're coming, trying to get up in the morning for work and you're coming to work and it's really hard. Have I, have I got that right? So we're just checking for accuracy. The next step is we want to encourage the person to seek help. By finding out, I, I would argue most people know what they need. And if we ask them what would be helpful, most people know if they're well enough what they need and what, what might be helpful to them. Or we can brainstorm a bit together and perhaps come up with some first steps um, towards a solution if that's appropriate. The next thing we want to do is make sure we follow up with the person. If a person's disclosed to us, um, it's really important that we follow up and we let them know that we appreciate that. So I think um, later that day or the next day, it can be good just to check in and say, you know, thanks so much for um, sharing that with me yesterday. I'm just wondering if you have any other questions, if there's anything you want to add, and perhaps too how you're feeling about that conversation and letting them know you're happy to have more of those. Also good to check in then a week later to see how they are, see what steps they've managed to, to take since you last met. Remember too, often trust can be low at the start when people are asked a question about a change in behaviour. So it's often the second or third conversation when they've seen that our interest and concern is actually really genuine and that we want to be supportive, that they might open up. So it's often the second or third, often the third conversation where people will actually open up. Okay, so a little summary then. We want to have these conversations in private. The timing of these conversations is important too. Um, we want to keep our questions open using um, acronyms like TED can be helpful. We also want to stay focused on the behaviour we've observed. We don't want to be putting opinions in. So, um, you know, I've, I've noticed you've been, 
you haven't been coming um, to the trivia or you haven't been coming to the chess club that you love that we usually have um, at lunchtime on Tuesdays. And that's unlike you because I know you really like that. How are things with you? Okay, that, that's, that's not like you. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you are? And we want to be using our active listening. So we might do all these things and the person might respond and I cross their arms and say, I'm fine and not give us anything. What can we do if that happens? Really important that we remain respectful and concerned because this will let the person know that we're a safe person to come back to at another time if they do choose to open up. If we start to feel um, frustrated, it's really better to bring that conversation to a close, but make a note to check in when we're feeling calmer. Um, we also want to think about our relationship. The stronger relationship we have with someone, the more we can say, I've known you a long time. This isn't like you. You just haven't seen yourself. How are things? Okay. We want to look too at the verbal information and the non-verbal information the person's giving us. So if they um, if, if they're perhaps showing some vulnerability, perhaps they're crying a little bit we can perhaps gently and respectfully ask a little bit more information because they wouldn't share that vulnerability just with anyone. If instead they're crossing their arms, their, um, their voice deepens and they say, I'm fine, okay, for example, that might indicate that they're feeling threatened and they want you to back off and they want you to go away or perhaps their body language closes up. Um, yes, yeah, so that's something to be noting as well. We do, however, want to persist with our care, persist with genuine care, persist with our questions, keep coming back to those changes in observed behaviour, and if appropriate, maybe offer a different time to talk because maybe the time's not good, or a different person because we might have an okay relationship with the person, but there might be someone else they feel more comfortable um, to have a chat with. Okay, so... Sorry, I'm trying to get the slide to move. There we are. So in these conversations um, we, with someone we're concerned about, we really want to focus on encouraging the person to talk while we listen supportively. We want to make sure the person's aware of the kinds of help available and if appropriate, take them, um, look at some steps towards a solution as well. Okay, so this leads us to an evidence-based model, which is the, um, it's called the five ways to well-being. And what I think, um, so Dane Carol Black from the UK had a research question, and it was, if there are five simple things that every person can do every day that will make a significant difference to well-being, what are those things? And we're very passionate about this model at the Black Dog Institute. And this model is now something that's used in the UK, in Canada, New Zealand and Australia, within the government, as well as within um, uh, um, corporate organisations as well. So let's have a look what they, what they found. So they, got, they had 400 researchers go away who were experts, um, international experts in neuroscience, psychiatry, psychology, um, education, and economics, and they siphoned down the findings to these five things. So the first of these is that it's important that we connect with a relationship that is supportive and, um, yeah, that we feel close to each day. And this makes a big difference to our wellbeing, the research shows. So it might be that on a Monday morning when we're not in lockdown, um, that we have a conversation with someone as we have a cup of tea in the morning um, at work and talk about our weekend. It might be that we talk with a neighbour on the way home. It might be that we have a walk at lunchtime with a colleague, but different ways that we can connect um, with someone uh, each day make a big difference to our wellbeing, the research shows. The second thing they found is that physical activity is actually really good for our wellbeing and daily physical activity can make a huge difference. In fact, 30 to 60 minutes of, of a moderate physical activity, okay, can make a massive difference to our mood in particular. Um, there was some research where um, people with mild to moderate depression 
um, didn't take medication, but did 30 to 60 minutes, three times a week of moderate exercise. So just enough to get their heartbeat slightly raised. What they found was that after eight to 10 weeks, this was a, as effective as a mild antidepressant. So the key seems to be finding a physical activity that we enjoy and doing it regularly. Not everyone is interested in the gym or in running, okay? And the gym is something during lockdown that's difficult to attend, but finding something you love to do. So perhaps it is um, walking with a friend, perhaps it is cycling, perhaps it is dancing, perhaps it is um, kicking a um, football with a niece or nephew. Um, perhaps it's vacuuming on a Saturday morning to some favourite music and cracking a sweat. Whatever it is that, um, yeah, that sits well with you for physical activity, doing it regularly um, and finding that thing can make a big, big difference, particularly to mood. And I think during the lockdowns, people who have started being more physically active can make a big, um, have noticed the difference. The evidence also showed that if people had previously been quite sedentary, that physical activity had an even bigger impact. Continued learning is really, really important and learning something new each day can make a very big difference to our wellbeing. So this learning can be formal learning. It might be uh, some professional development or a step along the career path, but it can also be informal learning. It can be reading about part of history that you've always been interested in, but never had time to read about. It can be um, learning how to do a do-it-yourself YouTube clip. Um, whatever it is, the learning is good for a few reasons. It's good for protecting our neuronal connections, but it's also good for our stimulation, for our confidence. So think about a daily way of um, continuing to learn. The fourth thing they found is being aware and being present focused is really good for our well-being. So often when we're distressed, we can think ahead to the future and we can think, oh, what if this happens? What if things work out like this? What if, what if things happen in that way that I don't want to happen, okay? And we all can do that at times. Also, when we're distressed, we can think about the past and we can ruminate on things that have occurred in the past, things we feel ashamed about, we feel sad about, that we feel disappointed about. Um, and as humans, we, we can both go to the future and to the past and do that. What the research shows is that our well-being is the very strongest when we are present focused. And there are a few ways of doing this. We can use um, an activity called mindfulness, where, which you're probably all very familiar with, where we can focus our senses and our breathing on the present. Um, and there are some lovely apps, the Smiling Mind, the free evidence-based Smiling Mind app can be really useful for doing short breathing meditations for as short as three minutes. And what the research shows is that we can practice mindfulness daily um, over a three month period the well-being benefits of that can remain with us for several years. Not everyone's into breathing exercises or meditations. Um, so even just simply using our five senses and focusing in a, in a moment, in a meeting or on a walk along the river, five things we can see, four things we can hear, three things we can feel with our bodies, two things that we can smell, one thing we can taste. Just doing that simple exercise, whether it be in the shower, as you drink a coffee, um, in a meeting, all of that can help us bring us back to the present. The final thing that the research showed is that giving and help giving to others is really good for our well-being. And the research shows we feel better in communities where we feel the well-being of others is stronger too, and where we're able to contribute in some way to that community. So that might be volunteering, it might be giving financially, it might be giving of our time, of our listening, of sharing a skill. Perhaps we are, I don't know, good at computers or something and we can help someone with that. But by uh, helping others, perhaps giving a compliment, giving some positive feedback, by helping others in some way, this is also good for our own wellbeing too. So the website's there at the bottom of the page there, but I encourage everyone to have a look for within their workplace, within their personal lives too, because I think 
these strategies, um, the research shows very clearly make a big difference. And I think I love this model because I think it's simple, it's easy to do, um, and I love that it does make a difference too. So our key messages from this section, there are simple things we can do daily that can help build our resilience in these five areas of wellbeing. And these actions we know the research shows strongly can help promote and protect positive wellbeing in people and also in broader teams as well. So these are the things we've covered today. We've looked at recognising when people need support, responding with support to disclosures, um, and following up with reasonable adjustments as needed, if they're needed, because sometimes people don't need any reasonable adjustments, but they might just wish to disclose in case some reasonable adjustments are needed in the future. And reasonable adjustments can make a big difference, whether they're to environment or to tasks. We've looked at an evidence-based model for having a workplace conversation about mental health and wellbeing. And finally, we've looked at the five ways to wellbeing as a way of uh, promoting and protecting mental health in workplaces. So thank you very much for having me. Um, we're going to, I think Wojciech is now going to, um, yes, start the panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Sarah. And I'm gonna be, we're gonna be joined um, by Simon and, uh, and, and Lisa. Um, thank you so much for that, uh, I guess, very practical. Uh, would you mind just- uh, um, Putting it up. That's right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, thank you very much for that very practical session. Um, I, I certainly got a lot out of it, and I, I suspect um, everyone attending has as well. We're already getting a, a lot of questions through, and I'll come to them a, a little bit later on. We will commence our panel session um, with Simon and Lisa. Welcome, Simon. Welcome, welcome, Lisa. Um, I, I guess one of the, the first questions that, that kind of came to my mind was, um, you know, a lot of your presentation was, was focusing on how to prevent the mental health issues from becoming acute for employees. However, we know that many people are very good at disguising <laughs> that they may be experiencing difficulties and they can fly under the radar and delay mm -hmm. seeking support. So I guess my question is, I know you've covered some of the signs and, and, and perhaps Simon, given, given that you focus a, um, a lot of your work um, on, on, on autism and your cohort being autistic. What do you think are those signs um, and how can, how can we reach them? Well, thanks, Sarah, for a wonderful talk and thanks, Wojciech, for having me here. And um, I think one of the first things we need to think about is education and get a better understanding of um, mental health in one instance and neurodiversity, including autism, so we have a better understanding of the challenges that people face and what changes we can make in the workplace to make them more accessible um, and to know what signs to notice. And I think a key thing from Sarah's talk is uh, noticing changes in behaviour, so emphasis on change. So getting to know each other, getting to know your employees, so noticing when these changes arrive. Typically when we talk about mental health and autism, we can experience all the same sort of uh, signs and symptoms that um, you see in the general population, but we may see um, additional signs more um, associated with autism, such as an increase in um, repetitive behaviours and um, uh, talk about special interests and sensory seeking behaviours. So really noticing these changes in behaviours for the individual. And so within that space, I think, how can we reach people is getting to know each other, getting to um, know what our own signs, like I really like what Sarah said about our own signatures, um, um, what might, and communicating that with people around us. So I know from people I've worked with, for example, a support worker, an autistic staff member told a support worker that grinding his teeth is a real it's a good indicator that things are winding, he's getting wound up. So that gives the um, support worker or the manager the opportunity to come and say, oh, I noticed you've been grinding your teeth a bit. Is, is everything okay? Yeah. Another thing to think about in reaching people is um, a lot of what Sarah said, yeah, finding a good time, having um, a good approach and how to talk to people about mental health. I think also with autistic people might be thinking of alternative methods or 
alternative avenues of communication that might give them a better opportunity to feel more comfortable talking about how they're going. But also to recognize that a lot of people on the autism spectrum have had bad experiences sharing their life in the past and just recognizing that might be a barrier to people willingness to talk about what's going on. So I'd say alternate styles of communication like either through email or through text. I know some organizations use apps that have the ability to send a, a, an emoji, emoji, emoji icon to indicate how they're going during the day just to um, change the uh, need to seek um, support verbally or to give guidance on how to seek support. And, and I guess critical there is what you touched on being disclosure there, Simon. Um, uh, Lisa, I wonder whether, whether you've thought about what may be the pros and cons for, for an autistic person to disclose. And here we're talking, I guess, disclosure about the neurodiversity on the one hand, but also they don't necessarily need to even disclose that they can just disclose that they may be anxious or depressed, but maybe some pros and cons from your perspective. Yeah, um, so I think Sarah and Greg talks, I really enjoyed it, by the way. Um, yeah, on, on an individual level, um, as Sarah touched in, on an in her talk that pros to disclosure is, is that an individual um, autistic person might be able to sort of access those adaptations that, that we need in the workplace, um, you know, maybe getting the lights dulled down, you know, those horrible strip lights change. Um, things because employers are probably a bit more aware that those are their legal obligations when you don't, like, disclose your diagnosis. Um, another sort of individual thing I, I think um, is a really huge pro um, is sort of having um, to, to not mask as much. Um, uh, and that, I think that that allows autistic people to uh, be themselves a lot more, um, communicate like more authentically, and overall just reduce um, the the risk of um, ultimately burnout, which is kind of the worst case you know, scenario that we really want to prevent. Um, and when you're not masking, you're being more of your authentic autistic self. Um, I think you know that's going to lead to just enjoying your job a little bit more um, and sustainable employment. Um, so, yeah, that's... Um, and sort of more broadly, um, I think Sarah touched on a little bit as well about um, sort of like stereotypes and, and stigma. And so disclosing, you know, autism diagnosis in the workplace might help people learn more about autism. So there's lots of you know, stereotypes about autism, such as the... the that sort of little professor stereotype that comes from you know pop culture, um, Sean Cooper type. You know this is what autism, autism is like, and you know that that's not the case for for a lot of people. Um, so for me, I find that my um, what contributed to my um, delay in diagnosis was that a lot of my special interests are what are more like socially approved. So I'm very interested in, you know, in, in fashion and things like that. And so they kind of blend in with what's culturally um, expected. And if more people are diagnosing and disclosing that, hey, this is actually what autism looks like, I'm actually what an autistic person looks like, more and more people see it and recognise it and understand more about what is the what is the autism spectrum and they might actually be able to recognize it in an undiagnosed colleague a little bit a little bit better yeah thanks and I, and I and I guess one of the points that Kirsty made from the employer panel this morning Kirsty Richards from Sunport was in some sense all of these things aren't about autism <laughs> these are about culture these are about how workplaces function um, and so Yes, on the one hand, you've got these great resources and, and ways of thinking about mental health. Um, but on the other, there are just some very specific aspects of all of that which apply to, to autistic people and I, and, and I guess and neurodivergent people. And I, I'm wondering, Simon, the research that you've done um, and, and focusing on, on that cohort, um, what are the key insights of your research, do you think, so far about in, into mental health and uh, employing autistic people? Um, yeah, good question. 
So some just quick background about the work we've been doing. We've been working at uh, the Olga Tennyson Autism Research Centre with the DXE Dandelion Program. And part of that, we've been tracking the progress of people within the program. And what we saw from the data was that we didn't see the increase in mental well-being that you'd normally expect from someone entering uh, into employment. And from discussions with people within the program, we recognize that mental health is an ongoing challenge to sustainability of employment. And from the perspective of managers and support workers in the program that there weren't many resources with specific information for mental health and autism and neurodiversity. So DXE technology with the ANZ Bank brought us in to um, develop some training to support this approach. So from our some of the findings in supporting this is recognizing first the intersection between mental health and well-being and autism, but also with the workplace and creating work environments that support um, neurodiversity. So some of the key factors that impact on stress for autistic people is trying to navigate and fit into a world that doesn't necessarily match their way of being. So having that idea of creating autism-friendly environments, understanding neurodiversity more thoroughly and having a putting in practical um, steps to support neurodiversity in the workplace goes a long way in preventing a lot of stress within the workplace but also recognizing that stress for autistic people can come from just navigating the world also so for a lot of people just getting to work on public transport managing a sensor environment can add additional stresses within the workplace so um, being especially mindful of the workplace, how it's set up, how we support people and putting training and support in place. Yeah. Right. Um, and Sarah, I guess part of the, your presentation really was about how to build a um, and working towards this kind of ideal workplace or a better workplace. Mm -hmm. um, but there probably are workplaces in which uh, we could say that they they are toxic environments, or that a, or that a employee will find themselves in a toxic environment. And I think some of those signs will be, you know, that they're overworked, that they may not be feeling valued or appreciated. There may be a high turnover of staff. They may have a demanding or abusive boss. There may be it may be a very political environment with cliques and gossip groups. Uh, I guess if you're in that environment. <laughs> Um, what should you do when you find yourself there? <laughs> mm -hmm. I know that's a tough question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, look, I think that's, I think that's a really, um, it's a really important question. Um, yeah, I think, okay, so I think a few things. Perhaps look to see if there is anyone trustworthy as part of that leadership group. And, you know, some, some workplaces, I think you're absolutely right, some workplaces are quite toxic and some of the, um, I guess, factors associated with workplaces that contribute to poor mental health are some of the things you mentioned. Um, the research shows very clearly that if there are um, high demands on a person, high demands on a person in themselves aren't um, T terrible they're not great but if that's combined with low levels of personal control so I'm giving an example um, a call center for example where calls just drop into someone's ear continually and they've got no way of monitoring that that's actually um, a huge predictor of poor mental health outcomes so yeah and low recognition if there's not a lot of recognition and people for work and people are giving a lot that's also a big predictor of um, poor mental health outcomes so I think it's a tricky question if there's someone that is perhaps more trustworthy perhaps going to them for support that can be hard to discern um can be very hard to discern for anyone but um yeah it might be then not throwing the rag in and quitting the job straight away but starting to look for some other options and getting some support from outside the workplace to do that, um, perhaps to move into a different environment. Because a, a supportive environment, we spend a third of our adult lives at work, a supportive environment's going to make a big difference to general wellbeing and mental health. So, yeah. That's great. And Lisa, just, just to kind of ask you a, a kind of a similar question, especially from an autistic perspective. Um, 
Yeah, do you think you would navigate that that toxic environment or what kind of strategies would you deploy and employ in, in such a toxic environment? Um, it was interesting, um, that Sarah, that you mentioned the, the call centre because I actually have had a job in a call centre <laughs> just just like that and I can confirm. Me too. <laughs> and yes, it was... Um, I didn't, I didn't know it well. I, did, I ended up, yeah, I was actually terminated from that job for what I now know was me stimming and loudly on the phone. And, um, how, I would, how would I navigate a toxic environment as an autistic person? I think I would probably start to, to shut down. Um, I think that, yeah, that would, it would become very overwhelming um, and... Yeah, I, I love Sarah's suggestions um, about getting external support. Um, I probably seek support from my own um, network. Um, you know, speak to um, yeah, my my um, other autistic friends and sort of people that understand my. I guess some people um, with autism often we struggle. Um, a little bit with interoception so sometimes people that know me really well are often a little bit better at recognizing when I'm becoming um, stressed or maybe things you know in a work environment aren't good um, for me and sort of you know, trusting those people to sort of you know be an extra part an extra, extra extension of your brain almost and being like you know let's think this through um, you know how might this you know this play out sort of you know being a scaffold a little bit for your executive functioning I think that really helps. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I'm going to just turn and, and take a, a couple of questions uh, from the audience. So, so Sarah's asked a, a question. So this is around the uh, legal obligations that, that, um, that you mentioned, Sarah. And so are those legal obligations applicable to undiagnosed neurodivergent employees? Mm -hmm. um, and so for those that self-identify? Is, is, I guess, the question, so. That's, that's an excellent question. So, okay, best practice in workplaces would be that an employer, any symptoms of a potential, um, yeah, of potential neurodiversity or um, a co-occurring mental health condition like anxiety or depression, for example, that a workplace responds to those okay that would be very best practice and really the legislation is is hinting that that's what we should be doing okay because otherwise you, you could have as an employer law, lawsuit on your hands for not noticing and not um, doing something the actual legislation my understanding of it is i'm not a lawyer but my understanding of it is that you do need to have a diagnosis or to be um have some support of of that as well so yeah it best practice so the answer is best practice employers should be responding to people's uh, reports of symptoms and you know um, what their needs are um, a diagnosis is going to assist with yeah in some workplaces they're going to actually perhaps want some documentation around that as well and I guess Sarah a point that you made was that it's not necessarily having to diagnose a, 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 about any diagnosis and such it might be mental health condition it might be the anxiety and the, and, and the depression absolutely yeah. absolutely yep that's right that's right and it's whatever a person feels comfortable to share too yeah hmm. and so um another question here is what practices or processes guarantee the trust or that trust and privacy will be respected mm. when mental health problems are disclosed who can be trusted and who cannot <laughs> So. Yeah. Oh, is that to everyone? Um, uh, well, it is, but it, you sound like you're about to answer it, so go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, look, that's very hard, very hard to discern. I think actually um, having a conversation about that is really important. Um, for people in the audience who are managers or in HR, I think that that needs to be thought about really carefully. The worst thing we want to do is to erode trust. If someone has shared that, we want to really maintain confidentiality. The only time we can ever, the only time that a, a staff member can ever break that confidentiality is if it's someone safety is at risk. So actually people do need to keep that in complete confidence. Um, 
uh, yet how do we tell if someone I, I think the best way is actually to have a verbal contract or even a written contract around that um, I'm disclosing this to you this is what it, this is what I would do I'm disclosing this to you I do not want this to go elsewhere if I don't I might have certain people that I'm happy for it to go to but that would be um, you know my choice as the employee um, and um, yeah unless of course there's issues with safety then it needs to on a needs to know basis be shared but I think having a conversation about that and perhaps even getting it in writing could be helpful because then it's documented and yeah there's a bit more assurance perhaps around that that's just one idea I'm interested in your ideas too Lisa did you have any any thoughts about that that trust aspect in the workplace and what we would disclose No, just didn't, I guess just, just being mindful of um, the, um, what was mentioned earlier that often yeah, a lot of autistic people can have um, sort of um, yeah, bad experiences around um, disclosing um, and that, yes, yeah, that I feel like sort of trust kind of has to be kind of earned. Um, yeah. And Simon, did you, did you encounter this kind of disclosure and, and trust issues with, with the research that you've conducted? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's sort of a double-edged sword disclosure. You can get the support you need, but it can also open you up for um, discrimination and, and stigma. And that can be as minimal as not getting the, the key work tasks that you need in the job. Um, so to that end, I'd say to the employers, and it's, it's about creating a uh, culture of um, accessibility and diversity. Um, and that means not just having key buzz phrases or having a mental health document. It's about doing everything in your practice around promoting and supporting diversity, including mental health and autism. So practicing what you preach, sharing openly as managers, having education sessions throughout the organization, um, making the pathways to receiving support and receiving accommodations clear and the easily accessible for all people so they know what's available. And that should be from recruitment and onboarding, having just a demonstration of the workplace culture, not only yeah, through buzzwords, but through the practice of the organisation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and, thanks, Simon. Oh, sorry, go for it. No, I, was just going, I was just going to say, I really like your point, Simon, and how to discern about people you can trust and people you can't. The people who are putting into action these things, I think, you know, that, that's a really good design. Behaviour talks, and if people's behaviours are indicating they're supportive, they're responsive to... Um, neurodiversity to um, yeah to including that in workplaces to valuing that in workplaces and to supporting mental health conditions then they're the people you're looking out for to, to disclose to that that's not always easy to discern though because some people use buzzwords and are very good at using their buzzwords but yeah their hearts and minds not might not be aligned thanks thanks Sarah um, Lisa I know that you and I had a, a conversation um, uh, prior to prior to this session, and, and you were talking about why motivation is really important, uh, and why managers need to really understand the motivation of their staff as as a, as a kind of a yeah. key ingredient to yeah. uh, to manage to managing them well and building relationships. Um, yeah. Could you perhaps talk a little bit about some of your experiences with with motivation and and um, how that's important? Yeah. Um I find that um, autistic people, we can, we can often sort of work differently and communicate um, really uh, differently. Um, so there's a really neat, neat study, it's a Chinese whisper study, and um, they basically, they had uh, three groups and um, people, they had a group of autistic people, they had a group of neurotypical people, and they had a mixed group of um, autistic and neurotypical people. And what they found is with the Chinese whispers, it wasn't, um, that autistic people are not very good at communication per se. Um, the Chinese, there was only significant difference, uh, worse performance in the group that was autistic and neurodiverse, um, neurotypical people in the one group. So that kind of goes to show that sometimes when you've got that mixed communication, um, that yes, that's not necessarily as effective. So um, some kind of need managers, I guess, to be going kind of that extra mile and to kind of be thinking about, okay, this is what maybe what I would think someone 
doing this particular behaviour, is, is thinking in their motivations, but kind of checking yourself and stopping your assumptions. Um, so I guess um, my sort of experience is um, often as an autistic person, I like to sit down um, um, and I'm doing a task and I get very hyper-focused and I don't want to, um, you know, stop and finish that task just because, you know, the home bell's gone. Um, essentially, it's 5 p.m. I should be going. I do much more effective work if I can finish task that I'm set on. Um, it's very difficult for me to pick up and put down tasks. And sometimes managers might be like, not understand that kind of way of working, you know, oh, you know, and, and be concerned about burn, burnout and rightfully so, but not sort of understanding that that's the way that this, you know, some autistic people, you know, maybe work a little bit more effectively. Um, yeah. So, so at the end of the day, I, I shouldn't be telling you off to go home early if, if indeed what you want to do is just finish off that report writing and, and, and get that done. I think it sort of goes back sort of full circle back to Sarah's stuff at the beginning about just, just checking in, saying like, you know, is is this way of working, like working for you, you're good? Yeah, okay. And then, yeah, and yeah. Establishing, you know, establishing that trust, um, a culture, um, neurodiversity um, supportive culture because then as an autistic person, if the, the culture is supportive of neurodiversity, I'm going to have that trust to then open up. And if, you know, if um, you know, I'm doing an increase in um, sort of behaviours that aren't helpful or adaptive to me, I'll feel that I'll be able to go and talk to someone in my workplace if that culture is neurodiversity supportive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thanks. I've got another question from, um, uh, from the audience, and I, th I think this is probably for, for each of you, really. What advice would you have for senior leaders who identify as autistic and find it challenging to notice changes in others or have conversations about other people's mental well-being? So, Simon, I'll, I'll throw that one to you first. Um, well, I think the first step is has already been made, which is get to know your own um, approach and what is what's more comfortable for you and getting to know how you behave. But it, is I think the similar sort of approach is learning how and when. Sarah's talk gave some good instructions around how best to approach people, um, learning what the signs are in other people and how how best it might be that they, they what they might come in, getting to know people so you can see changes in behaviour. Um, I think I'm just repeating what I said earlier. I'm not sure if I quite answered that. Um, <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll, uh, Lisa, any, any thoughts if, if, if you were to advise a senior leader um, who's, who is autistic? Sorry. I definitely agree with um, what um, Sarah said about the, um, the, the acronyms, love acronyms, the, the TED, um, and, you know, paraphrasing um, and learning a little, yeah. Um, I actually chose to become a psychologist because I have a sort of special interest in um, human behaviour. I just wanted to understand more about people, but now I know that I wanted to understand more about neurotypicals. So understanding, um, I did a certificate in counselling skills before my clinical training, and that taught me a lot of like things about how to, paraf you know, how to paraphrase and things like that. Um, and it gave me a little bit more confidence about now I know about communicating with neurotypicals um, on, on their level so potentially suggesting um, that but also being mindful that that is a form of masking and it will be hard to often sustain um, so sort of balancing that with maybe knowing that you know uh, as an autistic person we do have different strengths and weaknesses and we, we don't have to be able to be good at everything and if that's something that you are struggling with it's okay to say that's not my area of, of forte. Um, you know, I'd prefer to pass it on to someone else in the management team. Mm -hmm. I think it's better just to do that. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, Sarah, you've been referenced there a couple of times and we are, I'm mindful of the time and there's another good question in, in, in the chat. So I, I might just throw to that if that's okay. Um, so are there strategies to support the well-being of the peers to the person experiencing anxiety? or depression and um, giving one person what they need for recovery can have a flow on effect that creates anxiety for other team members. So 
I'll throw, I'll throw that one to you, Sarah. Sorry, to me? I'll throw that one to you, Sarah. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yes, actually, yeah, look, you raised a really good point. Um, often there are flow-on effects. Um, so when there, when there are reasonable adjustments for one team member, um, of course, none of that needs to be communicated to the rest of the team, but it can create tension sometimes um, in a team if they think there's special treatment or, you know, or if their well-being is dipping as a result of that person receiving some reasonable adjustments. So I think it can be useful to have a conversation with the person who's had some reasonable adjustments made and say, what are you happy to share? Because sometimes if they they might even just say, you know, my well-being's been low, my GP said I need some reasonable adjustments, and then the rest of the team can settle a bit. And I think too important there um, to keep a strong eye on the well-being of the rest of the team as a manager, um, and to be fair as well too, and to yeah um, give that message that there will be support for any of one in the team, if there are times where wellbeing does need some support. And at this time, if it's disclosed, this person needs a little bit more support, it won't be forever either. Um, you know, often reasonable adjustments for a mental health condition are for that period of um, where it's needed. And then they are um, adjusted back as they're not needed. For neurodiversity, that's, you know, ongoing. So those are important to be ongoing as needed. Um, yeah, so I, I, what I would say is as managers to keep an eye on the well-being of the whole team um, and be fair about those and also give agency and choice if there are some tasks that um, can't be done by one person, give some agency and choice to the team about how they how those how tasks are split perhaps. And, and I think too for that manager to gap stop and, and say to management above, we perhaps had some changes in our team um, we can't take on anymore, you know, to protect the team a bit there too. Or what can we have taken away as well, if possible? Thanks, Sarah. Um, well, uh, unbelievably, we, we, we've come, we're coming to an end of this, of this session. I suspect we, we really could have gone for another hour and, and, a, and a half. Thank you to, um, to, to three of you. Thank you for the great questions that have, that have come in through the chat.